Showtime. Welcome to the show. I'm Brent Holland. And welcome, one and all. Tonight, Fright, settle in, folks. Get in your comfy chair. We've got a great journey for you to tonight. We're going to be talking about Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, the movie's just come out not too long ago. And uh, we're going to be looking at a new book by our two guests tonight. It's an anthology of 12 different short stories of Sherlock Holmes. And Sherlock Holmes in this anthology, folks, is married to both the paranormal and and the macabre. Our guests tonight are Charles Prepolek and Jeff Campbell, all the way from Calgary, Alberta, in Canada. We're going to be getting into this book, folks. Settle in, get the coffee going, get the tea going, get a beverage of your choice going. If you're driving across the 401 or the Trans Canada, ease off the gas pedal. Let us take you on this journey for the next hour. It's going to be a great show, folks. Strap in and hang on. Here we go. There is a time to question. There is a time for answers. There is a time to challenge. There is a time to speculate. There is a time for change. There is a time for truth. The time is now. Welcome. Night Fright, your voice in the dark for Paranormal and Conspiracy Radio. And now your host, Brent Holland. Welcome, folks. Welcome to Night Fright. I'm your host, Brent Holland. Charles Prepolek and Jeff Campbell are joining us tonight all the way from uh, Calgary, Alberta via Skype. We're going to be talking about their new book, which is an anthology of 12 short stories on none other than Sherlock Holmes, but with a twist. Sherlock Holmes is married in these stories to the paranormal. That's right. The paranormal is the main focus of this narrative. I want to welcome you both to the show for the very first time, and thanks for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure, Brent. Uh yeah, that's that's Charles uh, on your left, by the way, folks, and that is Jeff on your right. Let's get into this book right away, shall we? I'm going to get something right from the book right away, which enticed me this afternoon. And oh. by the way, fo- folks, you can get the book very easily at your, cha- your fellow chapters uh, right around the country. That's where I got the book. Uh, this one puts Holmes and Watson up against none other than the devil himself. This one's called The Adventure of Lucifer's Footprints. I'm going to read from it. The author's name is Christopher Fowler. It began three months ago when the footprints first appeared, and it has recently culminated in death and madness. I saw the sparkle in Holmes' eyes and felt his excitement like electricity in the room. He knew the game was afoot. Can't have a Sherlock Holmes movie or, or anything to do with Sherlock Holmes without that little saying in it. Please be seated and tell me more starting at the beginning, he said. My father retired from the military world but found life hard to adapt at the Balstow Grange, Miss Woodham explained. He inherited the property from his grandfather and upon his retirement we moved from Worcester to Devon. Hoping to restore the house to its former glory, it wasn't long before we heard the stories. What stories? You must understand that Belstow Down is a close community, Mr. Holmes. It centers around the rows of villagers, cottages, and parish church, and the Grange. It's quite ancient. There was supposed to have been a Roman encampment at the site. Storms often washed away the roads, keeping the, vi- vi- keeping the village isolated. I'll get there, folks. A few will up keeping the village village isolated and the residents prone to superstition. There is a legend that says when a terrible crime has been committed, the devil sends his legions to the lost to take ghostly and ghastly revenge upon the perpetrator. And your villagers have recently had reason to believe this has once more come about. Holmes tapped his pipe and sent aromic blue clouds into the room. Please describe the circumstances. On Sunday afternoon, the head groom and his staple boy had been returning the horses from exercise when a sudden storm arose. 
The sky blackened and the wind howled, bringing squalls of rain. Have a little bit of fun. Bringing squalls of squalls of rain that hammered against the house and flooded the grounds. I and my father watched from inside the Grange. When the tempest finally passed, the stable boy was discovered in a state of shock from which he has not recovered, and the groom was found lying in the middle of the lawn with his throat cut from ear to ear. And for the rest of that story, folks, www.nightfrightshow.com. Just click on tonight's guest book cover. or the book. You're going to love it. You know, it's a great time for a book like this. It's cold outside, the kids are asleep, or you're at school, you're on the bus, you just want to read some really short, fast stories and get engulfed and taken in. It's a book for you. The book is called Gaslight Arcanium. Our two guests tonight have put together 12 short stories uh, to entice you about Sherlock Holmes, but married to the paranormal. As you can see the book, the book, uh, in the book, the story I just read, has the devil in it and it's edited by Jeff Campbell who's on your right tonight and also by Charles Prepolek. Yeah I got that too but hang in there. Uh, (laughs) We're doing this via Skype folks and what can I tell you. Um, Skype is full of its problems and its own issues but uh, for the most part we'll get her done. So fellas this is your third anthology. Well, our third with Edge, anyways, but uh, it's actually our fifth for Sherlock Holmes-related stories. What is it about the Sherlock Holmes narrative? See, I love mysteries, and uh, one of the things that attracted me to this book was the fact that there are heady mysteries in here. One of the things that turns me off in a lot of stories, especially movies these days, they seem to be inundated with special effects just for the special effects' sake. What I like is this book got in my head and I got inside the characters as well. Um, is that what draw, drew you two guys to the narrative of a Sherlock Holmes tale? I'd say so. Uh, we've always been big fans of Sherlock Holmes, but there's a, a lot of material out there that doesn't seem to quite uh, understand Sherlock the way that uh, the people who've read the original stories do. Uh, we wanted to be very true to Sherlock Holmes in these collections. And what is the truth of Sherlock Holmes in your perspectives? Well, the biggest deal about Sherlock Holmes stories are the characters of Holmes and Watson. You get them right, you can do whatever you like with them, basically. I that mean, dynamic. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a friendship. It's, you know, these two guys, they'll face any odds and come through it because they're good friends. They can rely on each other. They know what they're doing. I mean... Uh, Holmes, Holmes is a brilliant genius. There's a great attraction there, but really, getting the stories right, the most important aspect is the characters. The rest can drop into place fairly easily. Why the paranormal in this particular anthology? Why did you want to go more towards the dark realms, if you will? I don't know if that would be quite a phraseology to use in this case, but... Well, from my point of view, is it, Holmes comes straight out of the end of the Victorian period. Literature at the time is peppered. I mean, we're seeing Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Dracula, uh, various other characters. And this seems to be a real period where that sort of gothic horror permeates it. I mean, it's Jack the Ripper, it's Cobblestones. And they all seem to sort of fit within this same kind of framework. And I tend to think of it as the Victorian literature playground that has this supernatural overtone. And uh, Sherlock Holmes, this supreme rationalist, is plunk dab right in the middle of it. And he seems like a natural guide through that wide playground. You're listening to Night Fright, your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host, Brent Holland. What are your views on Lucifer, guys? Let's go a little bit esoteric, off topic a little bit. <laughs> That's what this show's all about, baby. We go in all kinds of directions. Yeah, Lucifer, huh? Uh, Satan, Lucifer, whatever. Um, you know, Beezle Catholic bug. upbringing, I find religious supernatural stories fascinating. To me, one of the my favorite films is still The Exorcist, the idea of devils, demons, and that. It, it adds something else to it. Give me, give me a devil or a demon rather than a guy with a knife. I'm a happy boy. From a belief point of view, ghosts, goblins, the devil, 
uh, we'll see you later. They are fun to read about. How about yourself, uh, Jeff? Why Lucifer? Uh, why the devil? What are your thoughts? Um, why Lucifer? Uh, well, I, I enjoy the, uh, the the horror side of it too. I, I I like a good monster, and he's the king of the monsters. Well, well, so. um, any personal paranormal experiences from the two of you you'd like to share with our audience? I got nothing. <laughs> I am an unbeliever. I'm afraid. Doesn't it's matter. Things. Anything you questionable know, can, ever happen? Uh, not that I can think of. I, I, you know, deep dark nights where you're walking alone, coming home after a night out. There's some weird sounds. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's a beautiful night, but suddenly you really don't feel alone. Yeah, I've I've, I've been down that road. But did I think that there was anything? Uh, Paranormal. Supernatural occurring? No, afraid not. Yeah, still on the Sherlock Holmes side of things. Still on the Sherlock <laughs> Holmes. Rationalist. Folks, uh, our guests tonight are uh, Charles Prepolek and Jeff Campbell. Uh, they've written a great book. It's an anthology of 12 short Sherlock Holmes tales. And um, they've gotten authors from right across the world, as well as some Canadian authors. And I'm going to read from one of those in just a second. Easy way to get this book, by the way, it's called Gaslight Arcanium Uncanny Tales of Sherlock Holmes. Triple W dot Night Fright Show. Dot com. Click on tonight's guest books cover, and that'll take you right to a spot where you can order the book from the comfort of your own home, which is a great idea tonight, as it's uh, here in Kingston anyways, folks. It's blowing snow. I don't know what it's doing in Calgary, but uh, it's Canada in the winter. What can you do? And uh, it's a great time, actually, to read a book like this, without question. Um, as I said before, I'm going to read a Canadian story right now. Um, and this one takes place in Canada's desolate uh, northern tundra. And this one caught my uh, caught my eye. Uh, great book, folks. Sherlock Holmes and the Great Game, it's called. And it's by Kevin Cockle. And he's in Calgary, by the way. Yes. The jagged majesty of the ice-filled Watson with primordial awe. He'd seen a fair piece of the world, been to every corner of the empire, either with or without Holmes, but he had never quite seen anything to rival the vast, bleak Canadian North, and we're all very familiar with that. Walls of ivory jutting into the clear blue sky, drifting uh, serpent, uh, serpents of wind-blown snow. Now, you see the way the language and the phraseology and the writing just paints that picture perfectly. And this is what this book does. It just draws you in and grabs you and puts you right in that environment, and you're kind of not just observing, folks, uh, the mysteries that are taking place. You're involved almost uh, beyond a spectator realm, if you will, and that's what I really liked about the book. It just draw draws you in. Uh, cool pools of blue shadows in the leaves of icy rises, water so clear and clean it looked like glass. I quite honestly don't know what to make of it, Lieutenant Colonel Gerald Reed had said back at camp in Dawson. He was a priggish man, but resolute enough with a back straight as a mainmast and a neck thick as a kilderkin. Before him on his desk lay the papers from Whitehall, complete with parliamentary seal outlining the terms of home special service. They are, well, that's to say, a tax of some kind, as it were. A tax? Holmes repeated, implying the imposition of main force, warfare. Am I given to believe does not exist here in the sense that we employ it? Whole settlements destroyed, Holmes. Systematic casualties exacted to the last man. Pursuit. That's not tribal. That's not a tribal vendetta. No way. It's rather more European, as it were. And you suspect, Reed swallowed, mustering his confidence, the Russians. Now, if you want to hear the rest of that story and read it for yourselves, folks, www.nightfrightshow, click on the book cover. This book is full of these great stories. Let's talk about Kevin Cockle. How did you meet with Kevin? Did he just um, heed the call? Um, well, we'd actually run into him uh, at a, he'd written a book, a short story for Edge, uh, Tesseract collection. Edge Publishing. That's mm -hmm. correct. Yeah. And um, he and I belong to uh, the same writers group. So uh, I we asked him if he was going to submit, and he's like, "Oh well, I don't think I know enough about Sherlock Holmes." And 
well, give it a try. And, and that was, we were very pleased to read that story from him. Absolutely. And what was it about that story that hooked you guys? Was it the Canadian in it or was it the story itself or? No. Uh, this one, this one's all me. This one hits one of those marks that for me, I'm a big fan of hammer horror films. And when this crossed my desk, it was basically, I found myself sitting here looking at it going, oh my God, this reminds me of Hammer's The Lost Continent. Uh, you know, it, it, it was just amazing to me uh, that Kevin did this. I mean, we've got, uh, what is, is it, Mayan or Aztec, uh, Mayan or Aztec god stuck in the Arctic of Canada. He plays around fast and loose with uh, Sherlock Holmes and characterization, but it's that hammer vibe when they find that spanish galleon in the ice it's just oh yeah that's where we're at and hammer you know you do that you push my bells i'm ready to go it just worked and hammer folks was um, a british company uh, renowned in the 40s, the 50s, and the early 60s, I think. If I, I know it, the 50s for sure. As a kid, I used to stay up late and watch their horror films. They were renowned for uh, great horror films like vampires and things of that nature, and, and the films that you just uh, you just mentioned. And this is more than just a classic sense of that. Um, this actually, like I said before, what I really liked about this is the pictures it paints and just draws you and grasps you right in there so you're beyond being just a spectator you're actually involved from the safety of your own armchair mind you but <laughs> it's great the book is called gaslight arcanium our two guests tonight great guests folks uh really sherlock holmes aficionados charles prepolek got it charles jeff campbell triple w dot dot com click on tonight's guest book cover to get right to a spot where you can order the book from your own home Okay, guys, you're both writers in your own right. Uh, for me, just a little bit of nonfiction reviews, the introductions to the various books. Um, but Jeff, no, Jeff writes fiction. Yeah, okay, guilty to that. There are a lot of students listening right now, uh, budding, aspiring writers. Um, what are the qualities in a writer that you look for? No, we look for a unique voice. I, I think that's the big challenge for anyone learning to, to write is to, to find their own voice and, uh, you know, pin it to the page. Is that beyond um, originality? Uh, what's the word I'm trying to say? In other words, you're not looking for somebody to mimic someone else's style. You're looking for an original style, would you say? Uh, an original style. Um, I, I think every writer has... Uh, themes of their own, mm -hmm. uh, but it takes a little uh, digging to, to find out what they really are. The, the stories that really resonate for you mm -hmm. are, are the ones that you should be writing down, not chasing sort of the market. And Charles, do you ever come across a great story but so poorly written that you have to pass it by? Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, afraid so. But I, it's mm -hmm. not. It doesn't happen very often with the books we've done, since we generally do an invitation only, and it's not I an see. open slush pile. So, you know, with that and the fact that we are dealing with generally professionals on the whole, uh, it's not a lot of amateurish writing that we're really getting hit with. Occasionally, you know, we will get submissions, friends of friends, that sort of thing. And, and you, you accept them, of course, to take a look at them. But in some cases, yeah, there's, there's just too much work or, you know, a great idea that just isn't expressed well. And there's not a lot you can do about it, really. You're stuck on it. Okay, I understand. Um, what would you recommend to budding young writers, uh, as I say, university, college age students that may be listening, or even high school students? Well, read. Read a lot. Read outside your genre. Don't read just what you want to write. I mean, you want to. There's elements of horror, mystery, um, drama in just about everything, really. And don't get caught up in the genre trap where all you read and all you want to do is I, I want to be the next Stephen King I want to be the next so-and-so no find your own voice read a lot and draw it all together and you know having a good grasp of the English language helps <laughs> no kidding yeah check your spelling <laughs> okay folks we're speaking with Charles Prepolek and Jeff Campbell all the way from Calgary Alberta tonight uh, on the um, I was gonna say on the phone via Skype of course and uh, it seems to have settled down Shh. 
<laughs> Maybe it was all that talk before about Lucifer that uh, upset the god, so to speak. <laughs> Gaslight Arcanium is the name of the book. <clears throat> Fascinating, fascinating stuff here, folks. These are all Sherlock Holmes-based stories. And uh, they use Sherlock Holmes as the main character to drive you through the narrative of all these stories. There's 12 of them. And as I, I'm so fond of saying, as I said before, with an anthology, if you're not happy with one story, turn the page. There's a new story right there and a new adventure to take you right along and it's a wonderful book um, if you're on the bus going to university or uh, you've got some time at night when the kids are asleep or whatever terrific book for you www.nightfrightshow.com just click on the book cover that's uh, associated with tonight's guests and take you right to a spot where you can order the book and it's by one of my favorite publishers uh, Canadian publisher out of Calgary also Edge Science Fiction can you guys talk a little bit and uh, promo Edge a little bit for us all because I like to get behind these guys because um, they're Canadian and they have more than that though they have quality quality authors and they're giving a chance to people that normally don't get a chance, and that I admire quite a bit. Could you talk about your relationship with Edge and how you came came to meet them? Well, with Edge, um, and we have to tip our hats to Edge too, because uh, they're a science fiction publisher. We went to Brian uh, when the World Fantasy Convention was scheduled for Calgary, and said, "This is a great chance for us to uh, do a Sherlock Holmes fantasy mashup." Uh, it, it, it's an anthology because that's a great form for the Sherlock Holmes story. Sherlock Holmes is famous for the short story form. Um, and there's not a lot of publishers that would have said yes to that. That uh, was a little outside their comfort zone. Uh, but uh, got behind the book. We launched at the World Fantasy Convention, and um, now we're three books in. Uh, it was a big chance to take, and uh, we're, we're very happy that it uh, paid off for them. And uh, not only for them, but I think the readers as well, because the stories are just outstanding. Um, Charles, let's uh, let's talk a little bit outside the box again. Um, you were mentioning before, <laughs> I love to do this, uh, you mentioned before that you do non-fiction reviews. Uh, what types of things are you involved in on a day-to-day -day basis? Oh, I've got to tell you, it's all Sherlock or it has been for the past decade or so. I started uh, writing a number of reviews for Sherlockian journals, the occasional article, bits and pieces like that. And I still manage to do the occasional bit of book reviewing, but it's, it's the time it just isn't there anymore. I understand. Let's talk about the movie, the latest movie with uh, Robert Downey Jr. and uh, Jude Law, the, the new one that's out. Um Jeez, I don't even know the subtitle to it. I know it's called Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes, A Game of Shadows. Et voila. I have seen it, and mm. i got to tell you, folks, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It is heady. Uh, there's action in it. Remember I mentioned before in movies there's too much CGI and stuff? There is in this, but it's not to the point where it doesn't drive the narrative along, and that's what I liked. It serves the story instead of vice versa. The CGI is the story. What are your guys' perspectives of, of the movie and the Robert Downey Jr. character? Oh, shall I oh boy. In? Shall you oh, boy. I think I just opened up a ahead, Pandora's yeah. box, folks. Go ahead. We, we enjoyed the, I enjoyed the Robert Downey Jr. Uh, portrayal of Holmes. It's not strictly speaking the Holmes in the canon, but it's very much based off that. Every film that comes along chooses what aspects of uh, Holmes's character they'll emphasize. Uh, also very much like Jude Law's uh, Dr. Watson. He was really a high point for me. In the past, you've seen a lot of uh, Watsons where he's there for comic relief, or he's there because he's Holmes's friend, and Holmes needs someone to explain things to, but he doesn't really serve a purpose on his own. Whereas I think, uh, in well, both in the Robert Downey Jr. movie, and the uh, BBC Sherlock series. Watson's really come into his own. Um, I think uh, there's a tip of the hat to uh, David Hardwick in the Jeremy Brett series there, where, where Watson really uh, Watson really became a character on his own and not just the window you looked through at home through. And uh, Jeff, how do you feel? Well, that was Jeff. But oh, sorry, um, I mean Charles. <laughs> I'll, I'll give it a shot. Yeah. Uh, for me, I mean, it's... it's uh, fun adventure movie. In some ways you can look at Sherlock Holmes as the world's first superhero, the uh, the literary action hero, and 
uh, you know, I mean, Batman and, and numerous characters, the shadow are all kind of derived from Sherlock Holmes in a way. And the Robert Downey Jr. movie, it's exciting, it's fun. Holmes was an expert single stick player. He was a master of baritsu, a martial art. I mean, there's a lot going on there and that's fair enough. It's an action film. It's a Hollywood action film. There's the best thing about them, aside from Jude Law's Watson, I think, is the uh, the way they get inside Holmes' head and how he goes through things where we see him, he's about to hit somebody and he says, okay, I'm gonna hit him here, there, there. He's gonna be out for X amount of time. And that's it. But, it, but it gets you inside Holmes' head, which we rarely get to see in a film portrayal. So, I mean, in that regard, it's fine. Holmes, Downey Jr., Downey's too short, too American, too scruffy, but eh, it's still fun. It's still fun. It's still fun. Uh, what I like about uh, Downey's Holmes is he's less than perfect. Uh, not only physically in his physical appearance, uh, but he's less than perfect also in other realms. Um, when he, uh, you know, people make make jokes and he doesn't get them, and then all of a sudden, uh, I'm thinking of the one in the first movie, where he's talking about uh, a chambermaid, and he's got a police officer in the uh, little carriage with him, and he said, and it, and and the police officer, who's really a B or a C character in the movie, comes out with a line and says, "But Mr. Holmes, my wife is a chambermaid." And Holmes's face is like this, and then the police officer leans to, towards him in his ear and says, "Just kidding." And to me, that is priceless. I mean, I retained that from the first movie all those years ago. Uh, so there's aspects like that I really enjoyed about the, those characters too, folks. We're talking about Sherlock Holmes tonight. If you're just joining us, we're just at the halfway point. Settle in, relax, get the tea going, get the coffee going, get a, a brandy going. Why not? It's Sherlock Holmes tonight. Uh, settle in, relax. This is your time, folks. Stick your feet up on that comfy chair. Get the comforter up if you're a little bit chilled or turn the fireplace up a little bit uh, another notch. Uh, just relax. We're talking about a great book that's just come out called Gaslight Arcanium. Our two guests tonight are from Calgary, Alberta, and they've put uh, they've edited this book and put together 12 short stories of Sherlock Holmes, but with a twist the twist is that they're paranormal oriented stories and I've read from two of them I'm gonna read and read another one right now easy way to get the book www.nightfrightshow.com and we all have fond connotations of Sherlock Holmes without question I just want to continue with the movie theme though for a second um, it just popped in my head James Bond you know we've seen James Bond folks go through morphous uh, metamorphosis uh, from the beginning to the end um, and it's still going on. We've seen a, a tough character in Sean Connery, and we've seen a really tough character right now in the James Bond. And we've seen fluffy characters, but they seem to serve the time and the place. Do you feel that um, perhaps the Downey character is serving that as well? He's reflecting more of this time and era than perhaps when, J uh, when um, you know, the late 1800s, something like that? Well, definitely. I mean, any of the... Sherlock Holmes is the most often filmed character in film history, period, bar none. I mean, Dracula probably gives him a run for the money. Tarzan's picking up third, but Holmes definitely is the most often filmed character. And I mean, he's been filmed since 1900, essentially. Wow. And every time out, yeah, they're, they're very much reflections of the period that they were filmed in. Um, we, we look at uh, the early silence with Eileen Norwood, they're set in the 1920s, yet it's so close to the Victorian era. Looking back, they seem to be more a reflection of an earlier time. The Basil Rathbone movies of the 30s, well, uh, into the 40s actually, 40s, at Universal yeah. of course, we find Nazis in there. Um, yeah, they're definitely reflective of, of the period and where the world is at. In the 50s, you see Hammer picking it up with The Hound of the Baskervilles with Peter Cushing, and yeah, we, suddenly we've got a giant tarantula, Stapleton's got webbed fingers, and I mean, it's, it's where you are. And in the late 60s, early 70s, we get a revisionist take on it, almost a counterculture take with Billy Wilder's The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, um, The 7% Solution, of course, Nicholas Meyer's fantastic story and film with Holmes, the cocaine addict, uh, yes. in major withdrawal. I mean, it's the early 70s, right? And yeah. it, what, what reflects the period really more than that? 
Um, by the end of the 70s, we've got a grim but social consciousness kind of creeping into homes with Murder by Decree, with Christopher Plummer, The Homes Who Cries on Screen. Um, in I loved 80s, his portrayal, by the way. I loved Christopher Plummer as an actor in general, but I loved his portrayal as well. Well, I, that was the second time he played it. He did it for a short television piece of a very traditional Sherlock Holmes story, Silver Blaze, the year before for, I think oh, it was Scottish that. television or something, and it, hardly anybody's seen it. Um, but it was a very, very different portrayal to what you saw a year later in Murder by Decree. Interesting. Um, yeah, slick back hair, all darkened, pale face, make him look like a withdrawn cocaine addict. Um, but, uh, you know, we jump from the late 70s and Murder by Decree into the 80s where we get into a more fantasy element. We get young Sherlock Holmes. We get the great mouse detective. There's more humor. We hit Without a Clue with Michael Caine and Ben Kingsley. And then in the 90s, we hit a kind of quiet lull. And then as we begin the new century, um, things start clicking. We're hearing, we heard stories out of Hollywood. There was a script that was sold, Sherlock Holmes and the Vengeance of Dracula. It was being opted by, I think, Columbia at the time. It was going to be a big deal. Jude Law was attached to play Sherlock Holmes. Wow. Um, and Christopher Cl or Chris Columbus was up for directing this thing. But, of course, they oh. offered him Harry Potter. He jumped ship. Oh. That was that. The thing went into limbo, and it was never, nothing came of it. And it took, you know, it was around 2006, 2007. I think 07 is when they announced the start on the Downey film. So, yeah, it, each one of these periods, definitely, you know, the films, and that's what film is about, obviously, to reflect the current culture. So, this book as that's well. it. I feel this book as well does that very, very well. And I'm going to read some more from it right now, folks. Uh, I'm going to read from Gaslight Arcanium, Uncanny Tales of Sherlock Holmes. There's 12 short stories in this anthology. Our guests tonight are Charles uh, Prepolek and Jeff Campbell. Easy way to get the book, www.nightfrightshow.com. Dot com. Click on tonight's guest book cover. This one is uh, Sherlock Holmes has become, you're going to love this idea, and I think it's fantastic, has become physically unable to die. Yep, that's right. It's called The House of Blood. And this is, uh, as I said before, this book marries the paranormal uh, in, in its narratives. And this is by Tony Richards. And I'm just going to read this. My God, he breathed. You can't have aged a day since Victorian times. Holmes nodded. So you really are immortal? I found it out after the Rickenbach Falls when I suddenly returned to life with no sensible explanation. A definite case in point, Lieutenant. I'm just going to flip pages here. I just wanted to get that uh, read. And Capaldi was aware of the detective's reputation. That's the fella who, uh, just to orientate you folks, because I'm jumping a couple of paragraphs, who was the inspector. Um... Capaldi was aware of the detective's reputation and had come prepared. He took a glossy photo from the inside pocket of his coat and handed it over, then watched with quiet awe as Holmes studied the thing. It had been taken at the crime scene. Monaghan sprawled out in the desert dirt. One of Holmes' narrow eyebrows lifted just a touch, but that was all. Let me make sure that I've got this straight. Nothing whatsoever connects the victims, not in terms of gender, age, hometown, occupation, or ethnicity. They were not even kidnapped from the same casino. The single thing that does connect them is that Lady Luck smiled on them beneficially shortly before they met their fate. By the way, folks, it's placed in Las Vegas. That's right. <laughs> and their winnings taken? The lieutenant nodded every time which would mark these cases as a simple string of murder robberies, except that each of the victims had been stripped practically naked and drained completely of their blood by means of punctures at the throat and wrists. They'd already established that my guys are calling them the vampire killings. www.nightfrightshow.com You're going to want to read that one for sure, folks. Settle in and... You know, keep the lights on when you read that particular one. The book is called Gaslight Arcanium, www.nightfrightshow. Click on tonight's guest book cover. Get the book. It's really worth it. Um, let's talk about that one. I was enthralled by this one because all of a sudden, 
we've left the eight, the late 1800s. We've established that now uh, a new sh- a Sherlock Holmes is immortal. Uh, and, and God love Watson. Watson has passed on, of course, because he's left all these people behind. Um, I understand the hook, I think, why you chose this one, because of its originality. But yet he's still Sherlock Holmes. Uh, what were the other things in this particular story, without giving too much away, that hooked you guys as well? Okay. The reason we have Tony in the book is I, I was at a convention. I was in uh, San Jose, California, and I, I, I wanted something from Tony. Um, I've read his work, and he's, he's a very talented individual. He's got a, a great collection of short stories behind him, a number of novels, and I wanted something from Tony. So I, I, I asked him to write me a story, and I guess Tony came back, and he says, you know, I don't really... You know, the Victorian period, I don't want to get caught up in that. I don't want to write that sort of style thing. He says, that's not really my bag. And I said to him, well, you know, the point here is go beyond the lines. Color outside the lines. Do something different. Give me something weird. Give me something out there. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really know where that was going to go. And I don't think Tony really did either. Mm -hmm. Right. So when he came back with this, it was like, okay, I get this. You know, it it kills me that there's no explanation for the immortality, okay? And you could you, you could write a whole series around this, which Tony incidentally has been doing, writing more short stories about the immortal Sherlock Holmes. But the other thing is, when this came across my desk, again, the Sherlock BBC series with the updating to the present day with Benedict Cumberbatch, and that, that hadn't been announced yet. We were actually ahead of the curve on this one. So when that came together, it was sort of like, oh, wow, okay, yeah, this is great. And plus, beyond that, it has this great 70s Night Stalker, Kolchak the Night Stalker vibe to it, okay? <laughs> Can you California. tell folks what that show was? I think we're dating ourselves because I remember that show. <laughs> that was a precursor to the X-Files, folks. It was on every Friday night. Um, it, it had uh, Gavin, um, what's his last name? I forget the character's name. Uh, Darren McGavin. Yeah. Darren McGavin, so thank you, uh, walking us through this uh uh, kind of a precursor to the X Files, if you will, but more of a paranormal vampire monster type of thing. It was great. It was kind of like, remember the movie uh, Fright Night? Uh, there was uh, there was a show on late at night on Friday nights, and uh, this was basically based on that show. Um, sorry to interrupt you, but yeah, it does have that feel to it, and this is what drew me to this. Uh, the whole book is packed full with this stuff. The well is deep, folks. Make no mistake. Yeah, you know, I've read only three small passages from three uh, of the stories the well is very very deep and if time allotted me and of course if i read the whole book to you (laughs) you wouldn't go out and purchase a book uh and interpret it in your own way and that's what's great about this book gaslighter canium triple w dot night fright show our guest tonight charles uh prepolek and jeff campbell have edited this thing and put 12 short stories about sherlock holmes with a marriage, if you will, a marriage to the paranormal, a little bit on the edge, and uh, of course, edge science fiction and uh, publishing are their publishers as well, so there's a little pun in there. Sherlock Holmes, what's next for Sherlock Holmes? Where do you see your next anthology going? Will there be a next anthology? Well, I think for the time being, Sherlock gets a bit of a rest. The next one we're doing for Edge is actually based around one of Conan Doyle's other characters, which is Professor George Edward Challenger, the lead character in The Lost World, the one that brought dinosaurs back in. And I mean, published in 1912, Challenger is this fantastic character. And going back to that X-Files thing we were just talking about, please. he's also a perfect guide or figure to draw on a wide variety of things. Uh, again, with that X-Files kind of vibe. Yeah. Now, a little steampunk, a little bit of X-Files, a little bit of supernatural, a little bit of pseudoscience, uh, you know. There's, there's lots of opportunities. And that's next on the cards for us for Edge is the Challenger book that we're working on. You know, and it, it's. I just realized too when I was reading this book before, um, it triggered something in my mind about the X Files as well. And here you've got Mulder and Scully, and what is Scully, folks? She's a doctor, and Mulder is the brainy one, if you will. Although Scully's not s- stupid, but here we have the same type of characters, and I'm wondering if that's what Chris Carter did with the two characters, if he based them on Sherlock Holmes and um, uh, Watson. Uh, I was just curious, how do you guys feel about that? I, I, I suspect that 
Uh, a lot of detecting duos, as it were, are based loosely on Sherlock Holmes one way or another. You've always got your, your savant, your genius, with his slightly dimmer or different oriented sidekick to, to be there, to draw you in as the reader or viewer, whatever the case may be, as, as you know, you, this character is so bright, I'm not so bright, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I find most detecting duos, I think in one way or another, owe something to Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes. Okay. With a question, in your case, <laughs> oh no! <laughs> Charles Prepolek and Jeff Campbell, who's Watson, who's Holmes? Well, fortunately, we're not detecting, so it's not really an issue. <laughs> Who's Batman? Who's Robin? Okay. I'm not I, wearing those shorts. I'm telling yeah. you now. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, the book is called Gaslight Arcanium. We're having some fun. Our two guests are from uh, Calgary, Alberta, folks, via Skype tonight, and I hope you're enjoying the show as much as I am. It's just great to talk about Sherlock Holmes with two aficionados. I'm going to read some more from the book. This one is called The Color That Came to Chiswick, and this is by William Meckel? Meckel? Meckel. 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 Thank you. Okay. And by the way, folks, he's from The Rock, and for my American listeners and viewers, The Rock in Canada, folks, is not Alcatraz. <laughs> it is indeed Newfoundland. We're going to talk about his isolation and uh, his writing style uh, uh, just after I read this. And this is uh, Watson describing what is taking place. Lestrade was unusually quiet, yes, Lestrade is back, folks, is unusually quiet in the carriage on the way to the hospital and would not speak of the condition of the victim. I'd rather not prejudice your opinion, doctor, was all he would say on the matter. I began to understand when I was shown into a small room in the hospital. The corridor outside smelled strongly of carbolic soap, and I noted a strange reticence on the part of the staff to venture close to the doorway. I walked inside to find a young man writhing on the bed, tearing at his throat. I called for assistance and moved to his aid. A bloody dressing, a green smudge clearly visible, lay discarded on the bed covers. The man's head turned to look at me. The whole bottom half of his face was a bubbling mess of green-tinged gore. Lestrade came quickly to my side and pinned the man's arms, holding him down. Just the sight of us seemed to calm him somewhat, and he was obviously in great pain. His wounds seethed, the green slime seemed to feast on his flesh. I have seen many men die of disease and corruption in warmer climes, but nothing of this speed or destructive capability. I had just bent to tend to the man when he screamed louder and his eye popped. Green tinged fluid ran down his cheek. And, and you know, again, folks, you see the language and the description here? When I read this, I'm right in that room standing right beside um, Watson. I won't say I'm Lestrade, thank goodness, holding him down, but this is the quality of the writing that's in this book. Um, it started to bubble at the joint of his neck and shoulder. The covers fell away from his chest and Lestrade moved aside, retching. Below the waist, there was, a little there was little left of the man, merely a rolling mess of green slime. And it just, this is right at the beginning of that story, folks, and believe me, it just takes off. And uh, you're going to want to read the end of that story and all the other stories that are in this great anthology. Twelve stories, folks, of Sherlock Holmes. Each one different, but also each one recognizable because Sherlock Holmes is the main character and it guides you right through the narrative all the way through the book. It's called Gaslight Arcanium, Uncanny Tales of Sherlock Holmes. And our guests tonight are uh, Charles Prepolik and Jeff Campbell. Jeff Campbell's on the right, and I'm sorry for calling you uh, Jeff before. Charles, although I'm sure Jeff would be uh, <laughs> very happy about that, and Jeff Campbell. <laughs> Charles Prepolek and Jeff Campbell. Uh, okay, let's talk a little bit about The Rock and William, and uh, how did you get to know William? I mean, according to his bio, and I'll, I'd be happy to read it, folks, um, Canadian writer from, the, from Newfoundland, uh, is a Scottish writer with 10 novels published in the genre press and over 200 short stories credits. Where is it? He lives in a remote corner of Newfoundland. 
Can you imagine? With icebergs, whales, and bald eagles for company, in the winters he gets warm vicariously through the lives of others in cyberspace and drinks a lot of beer. Some of it from Chiswick. <laughs> That's very funny. How did you come to meet Mr. Meekel? Ah, Willie's writing. Uh, again, uh, in this case, I'd read his work. He'd, he'd written, at that time, two books, The Midnight Eye Files, about a private detective in Glasgow with, uh, with an occult background. Uh, he was, it was an occult detective story, really, and quite liked it. He's got a, a really great pulpy style, and I don't think Willie would be offended for me to, men- to call it that. And I don't uh, think it's detrimental or degrading either. <clears throat> I, I, I like Pulp Fiction. No, and, and that's the yeah. thing with Willie's work. But again, Facebook, the internet, is a wonderful thing. You get out there and things move around, word of mouth passes. As I said, generally we move by invitation only. But with Willie, I think, I can't remember exactly how we pulled Willie. Yeah, I think it was a referral. And uh, of course, this is the second story he's given us. He gave us one in Gaslight Grotesque as well. And we like Willie's work. It's as simple as that. Besides, you know, a transplanted Scotsman out in the rock, he, that takes a certain something. Drinking beer. <laughs> Swinging them back well, a little bit. Of... We do have an appreciation of beer and the finer things in life. So <laughs> We're Canadian. What can we say, folks? You know, my granddad was from the Rock, and oh, that's nice. I just heard you all going, oh, that explains it about Brent Holland. Okay. Anyways, yeah, he was very fond of Newfie Screech. Let me put it that way. And uh, if you've ever had an opportunity or have an opportunity to try out some Newfie Screech, Make sure you have nothing planned for the next morning, <laughs> maybe the next two, three days. <laughs> Count on some time off. We're talking about Gaslight Arcanium tonight, folks. It's an anthology of 12 short stories about Sherlock Holmes, www.nightfrightshow.com. Click on tonight's book cover. We'll take you right to a place where you can order the book from the comfort of your own home. Okay, let's talk some more about... <laughs> You know, Watson, you had mentioned before, um, he was kind of the straight man, wasn't he, in, from the from the shows in the 30s and the 40s. He has... Not not the ones from the late 30s and 40s. Nigel Bruce, Bubis Britannicus. Yeah. I mean, he was, he was there specifically for comic relief. Uncle makes a noise and quacks like a duck. I mean, yeah. Not the straight man in that particular instance. Okay, got you. Okay. Um, how do you see Watson? I mean, this is a, this is a book about uh, Sherlock Holmes, but in one of the instances I just read, Watson is no longer around. Um, do, and it didn't hinder the story at all. Do you see Watson being weeded out of the, the narrative in the future? No, never. Never, You can, right? you can never have Holmes without Watson. Uh, even in the story... Uh, that you mentioned that the House of Blood where it said in the future and Watson's passed on there, there's always a moment and there's a moment in that story too where uh, Holmes remembers him uh, I, I think Watson is very much a humanizing uh, influence on, on Holmes so that even even after he's gone uh, Holmes will never forget Watson does he ground Holmes does Watson ground Holmes in this reality the same way that Scully uh, I'm going to use that as uh, an analogy that Scully grounded Mulder in this reality um, I, I, I'm not sure about the analogy exactly, but yes, I, I, I would certainly say Watson definitely is a grounding influence and a humanizing, which is really the most important aspect of uh, his role in the stories. I mean, Holmes, Holmes is a man who, he's a brain, the rest of him is a mere appendage. He will go for days without eating. He will, he just, he's like a child who needs some looking after at times, where he's so caught up in the workings of his mind that he forgets about all the rest of it and Watson is there in essence to uh, to remind him that yeah there's more to life than just that thinking I'm afraid I would say too that uh, Sherlock always emphasizes uh, with the perpetrators of the crime takes Watson there to uh, to keep him on an even keel mm. w- with the victims of the crime and the clients so he keeps the two of them together okay so the two of them are, are very essentially one without the other really doesn't doesn't work <laughs> it depends what they're doing uh, I mean there's obviously there well for instance the first story in the book the comfort of the sane uh, 
gives us a Holmes without a Watson as well, but it's a younger, formative Holmes. But there's somebody else. Holmes, in this case, is he's not the mentor, he is the student. Right? And there's always, that's also part of the element that we find between Holmes and Watson is, is the master, the magus, the, the leader, the, the, the sage, as it were. And there's always that kind of a follower, a sidekick. A sidekick is such a horrible word, but it's, yeah, I don't see him it, as a it is sidekick. A role. Yeah, um, you know, uh, let me just read this off the back of the book, and then we'll discuss some of it. The stink of a Paris morgue, the curve of the devil's footprint, forbidden pages torn from an infernal tome, all contain keys for the original Dark Knight detective as he unlocks the arcane secrets of men monsters and their evil is he the ultimate um good up against evil in your perspective good evil let's say he's the ultimate rationalist in a world of chaos looking to find order um i, I only him- i only ask that because you draw the analogy here in the back of the book to the dark knight and um in in the later Batman's he's not such a nice guy he's got a little bit of a dark edge to him um Sherlock Holmes in some of these stories do you feel he has a little bit of a dark edge as well to him more so than perhaps the original narrative um I would say with Batman it seems like Batman's uh out to to punish the evildoers with, with Holmes, it, it it doesn't really work the same way. Uh, if Holmes uh, had a choice between uh, punishing the evildoers or solving the puzzle, he'll always pick solving the puzzle. Um, well, I I think there's also an element of justice rather than uh, vengeance. I mean, Batman's nuts. He saw his parents killed before his eyes. He's he he's got the mentality of a child. That drive. Of, uh, of vengeance, that, that hurtfulness. Somebody hurt me, I'm going to hurt them, uh, come hell or high water. Holmes is more concerned with justice, the sense of justice. Mm. I mean, in one of the original Conan Doyle stories, at least, he lets someone that we assume, you know, they've, they've killed someone. He lets them go because the guy they killed was a really nasty individual. And maybe it was accidental. I mean, that's the Abbey Grange with yeah. the Croker and yeah. so on. But um, but Holmes, you know, uh, good versus evil. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that's the way to break him down. And do I, do I think our Holmes or the Holmes that appears in some of our stories is darker or, uh, or more tainted in that regard? No, I don't think so at all. I think most of our writers actually aim to capture the essence of the character that Conan Doyle provided but throw him out into a world that is a little different from what uh, what we've read before. What would you like not to see happen to Sherlock Holmes? I mean, I like the direction that <clears throat> this book has gone into. What would you? What have you rejected? What did you reject? What was the uh, perspective of, of writers that uh, just turned you off and said, "Nah, that's not what we're looking for." There, there was some pastiche there. There was people where the the insight into Holmes wasn't really there. They were it just seemed to be uh, trying to mimic uh, the Doyle work. Too formulaic, too uh, paint by numbers, that sort of thing. But I mean, what am I afraid to see where Holmes goes? Hmm. You know, he can go anywhere, really. Like I said, if you keep the character true to his essence, the basics of the character, you can send him out anywhere and face anything. Um, yeah. Hey, is part I like of, the Downey movie. I'm good for anything. Yeah. Is part of that essence the British background, the staunch British background, as opposed to making him a North American uh, character? Find out pretty soon. There's a series in development where he's set in modern day New York. I assume he's an American in that, but we're not really sure. Yeah, we're not sure at all. CBS has just announced that they're doing something called Elementary, which, I mean, push comes to shove. It sounds like a knockoff of the recent BBC series, Sherlock. Um, whether Holmes will be American or not, I mean, it's it's like in the 70s when they were battering around with James Bond. What are we going to do with Bond? There was a period where they were looking at casting Burt Reynolds as James Bond, okay? Oh, I didn't even know that. Yeah, yeah, afraid so. He was the most popular box office draw at the time, and they were thinking, yeah, we'll reinvent him in Burt Reynolds, that sort of thing. Instead so, of an Austin like- Martin, they'd give him a Trans Am to drive. 
Just hey. kidding. Just kidding. So, I mean, that sort of thing. Is Holmes a staunch British character? Well, he's an icon of British literature. Socially, he's, you know, he's a little bit bohemian and a little, not your typical Londoner or Brit, as it were. But, uh, you know, yeah, keep him English. Keep Doctor Who English. Keep Sherlock Holmes English. Keep James Bond English. Uh, but uh, beyond that, like I said, stick to the character. You can do just about anything you just like. Just about with. anything. Listen, Holmes. I want to... Please go ahead. Holmes. Sherlock Holmes has been through the ringer. It's, it's not like every Sherlock Holmes project that's come out since... He was first published has been faithful to the character at all and, and he survives it all he weathers it mm -hmm. endures folks uh we've been speaking tonight with charles uh, prepolek and jeff campbell they've got a terrific book out i urge you all to get we're gonna have to start to wrap up now the book is called gaslight arcanium uncanny tales of sherlock holmes www.nightfrightshow.com just click on the book tonight's guest book cover That'll take you right to a spot. You can order this book from the comfort of your own home and just get engulfed in the stories. There's 12 of them. They're fabulous, folks. You don't have to be a Sherlock Holmes fan to enjoy this book without question. I'm Brent Holland from Night Fright. See you next time. to Night Fright and your host, Brent Holland. The time is now. Your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. Radio.